everybody. So welcome to the very first annual Knowledge Graph Technology Showcase. You might be asking yourself, why is there a showcase? Well, I often get the question, which tool is right for the job, especially when I am dealing with knowledge graph and modeling questions. And what I would like to do is share with you some tools that I often point people to, some that are new on the scenes, some that are going to be a surprise. And before you ask, none of this is sponsored. I have not been paid to do any of these. I reached out to everybody on my own time. They were kind enough to meet with me and film these. So I hope that these honest reviews, all of these are my own opinions that I often help people with when they ask me questions. I hope this helps you in your search for the next knowledge graph technology that you want to dive into a little bit deeper. All of the vendors that I'm going to be talking to, I have more information and their contact information in the description below. And if I missed any tools that you wanted to see me review, or if you have questions about the ones that we are reviewing, please leave them in the comments below. I and the people that I'm talking to will be able to answer those questions for you. All right, and so what is the criteria that I'm going to be walking through? There will be a summary at the very end of each video describing the answers to each of these questions as well as a summary of any other little tidbits that we find out. So the main things that I ask are, what are the use cases that the tool is usually or best suited for? Also talking about that, what features do they have to actually support those use cases? That's pretty important in understanding if they're going to meet your needs. The other thing I like to talk about is what kind of data, what kind of format, and what kind of query language does the tool support? Two additional things I talk about, because I think they're pretty important, is first, interoperability. If a tool is not interoperable, sometimes it's a make or break moment. Other people don't mind if it's not interoperable. So we will certainly see people on both sides of the coin in these reviews. The other part is, is this SaaS or not? A lot of people that have small development teams or no development teams don't have the resources to set something up that's not SaaS. So I will be asking these questions as well as many more. So please join me in the next few episodes. So with that, let's check out this video's tool of choice, which is all right. And with that, let's go kick it off. So I'm Vasim Womchev and I'm the CTO of onto text. Uh, as a CTO, my role is really to control the product development of the onto text products. And I'm also the product manager of GraphDB. Basically, this is like my child. Uh, <laughs> and this is the front screen of GraphDB free. Basically, I will be demonstrating GraphDB free. We have three different editions. One is free. Uh, it has, it's a, we call this as a desktop application because it has nearly all features of the other editions. The only mm -hmm. difference is that it's worked for only two concurrent simultaneous connections. Mm -hmm. uh, in the standard edition, we don't have this limitation and the inter enterprise edition, we have a high availability cluster, a few other enterprise features. So when we speak about use cases, the knowledge graph has a wide variety of applications. And in the center, we GraphDB makes possible the knowledge graphs, which if you go to the classical topics of the market analyst, they will classify like a metadata management. The method, they say it metadata management because you don't deal with all the data, but just the meta model and mm -hmm. all the important mm -hmm. information. Yeah, and, and I love this because I can attest that I have connections. They, they are using GraphDB, your tool to actually um, do a lot of these things. So it's not just, um, you know, a company slide. I can say that I know um, at least one example of a company um, that I am familiar with, and I know people working with your tool doing each of these use cases. And the important organizational data is really stored in some sort of a spreadsheets, mm -hmm. or data catalogs, or whatever mm -hmm. really you have. We are going just to make one uh test repository this is the repository creation form basically this is kind of a database we mm -hmm. create our own database here uh and you can connect the repository which means that this becomes the default database which appear here mm -hmm. so we see this is an empty database and the first thing what i'm uh, what i can demonstrate is basically of course you can import rdf data but if you don't have already RDF data, you can generate this data by opening a project where you can import a 
tabular uh, data. Okay. So I'm going to choose one file, as a CSV file, we support JSON, XML files, or soft uh, file formats. And the tool can we we integrate with the Open Refine tool and we extended its support to better integrate with the RDF. Oh, I love that. I, I was going to ask. Onto Refine sounded a lot like Open Refine. So those of you that are familiar with Open Refine, it's going to use a lot of those same principles, which is great. A lot of people use that, and there's a lot of learning resources on that tool as well. Absolutely, and this is a fantastic tool for all sorts of data wrangling mm -hmm. and also data reconciliation. I'm, mm -hmm. And I'm going to say once you deal with the CSV files. Excel files or anything else, you're going to find all these type of uh, uh, strange things. So let's do some sort of a clustering. And if we do a clustering, the challenges of uh, working really good identifiers, you see that the same twist one time is with a dot and the second time is without a dot or mm -hmm. a clean, you have two different type of spellings. And there is a, for Crystal Lake, I'm absolutely not sure uh, if this is the same type of an entity, so I'm not going to merge it, but I'm going to merge these two type of entities mm -hmm. and I'm going to merge and select this type of. Uh, the other thing what usually I, when I start dealing with data is I do some sort of a faceting and th this can give you a very good idea for the distribution of the data. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One That's of the nice. first Yes, one of the first thing what you see here is that you see uh, this is probably the because it has the name state, it has the Colorado state, but here we have another hit, which is somehow suspicious why this is different. Mm -hmm. And typically you see that uh, we see that there is a space. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. all these type of small things, but once you start working with data, they start to really cause uh, massive problems. So this yeah. tool allows you to do this common transformation and to trail everything. And, and now having, see it, having it all in one tool is is incredibly useful. And once we do this, I'm going to just show you another final trick is uh, this is really the reconciliation service. And we are very often asked, OK, this is an Ohio state. It's clear, a simple example, but just to demonstrate that we want to translate these type of strings into things and we are going to use a public reconciliation service. You can also register your own or develop your own. Uh, so I'm going to see the, this reconciliation. We go to the Wikidata and what we see now is we took this type of a uh, two, two letter abbreviation and we want to map this to actual identifiers to know that Lebanon is not the country, but this is Lebanon, the city in the States. So I'm going to start this reconciliation task. Uh, basically, it's going to get the data. It has some many variations. Basically, it can use some hints like to say if you go to for a city, you can give a hint that this city mm -hmm. should be part of this state. Yeah, and, but, and I think that this is something that for those that are on the data science side that are using these tools, it is first interesting that a database has a workbench, which is what you're seeing on the screen here. A lot of databases are just a database. There's nothing for um, your business stakeholders to really see. Not only can you see something here, but you can also walk through some of these processes that uh, Vasil is going through with your stakeholders to show them the value of this, this type of framework, i.e. graph as well as the tool itself, which I have found very helpful in getting funding for lots of things like this. So what we can see now in the state column that we see now Ohio, and this is really a link to the Wikidata service where we say that this is the state, the United States of America. And you can see, you can even click this and see what's in Ohio and basically all mm -hmm. the different type of labels and uh, hyperlinks and picture. So now it's really this is the transformation where the string now became became a, a thing basically. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. further we can continue this process. The interface also gives you a way to see what was not much and we were matching this against uh, US states and mm -hmm. there are two entities which were not much and one is really the Washington DC. It's not a state yet. Uh, yes actually I had to check this. I was first thinking that this is an error in the Wikidata, but it appears that the District of Columbia is not a state. So this interface allows you also to choose one of the other variations, which are not perfectly matching the uh, the entity, but seems like that's down. really nice. Yeah, and I like that. And um, I don't know if it doesn't. What are the numbers after each of those lines? This is the score, uh, the scoring Ooh, of the. Nice. Uh, I like that. 
OK, the next type of interface is how you produce RDF data. I'm going just to quickly show this, but there is a visual interface which help you to get all these columns, even the reconciled columns. And mm -hmm. just by drag and, dragging, drag and drop, you can choose and the interface will guide you how to say that, uh, OK, this is the character. I'll, I don't mm -hmm. have the auto complete, but I'll say, OK, I, this is an RDFS label. And then I'm going to use the name uh, of the bank. And here the the interface asks me whether this is an IRI or literal mm -hmm. because it knows that this is an object position and it mm -hmm. gives you all the possibility to add uh, all the details of RDF like the language stuff and the, the language stack and the data type. So it gives you really a quick way how to produce this type of data. Also, the nice thing is you can preview the results here and you mm -hmm. can change the base IRI or mm. you can go in Sparkle and then directly query this information. There is also a streaming interface behind which allows you how you can visually get this type of transformation and really reapply them. Actually, all, if we save this, all these type of entities are pre-recorded. So uh, you can also batch process and all the steps we did manually at this point in the interactive mode, you can really automate and it. Another a way to approach this is to create a virtual repository and I have pre-created this virtual repository. Uh, you can check the graph. This is actually a new feature in GraphDB 9.5. If your data is already in a relational database, which has a very good amount of chance that your data is also already in a relational database, you can define a mapping file. There is a standard uh, W3C standard, which is R2RML or mm -hmm. OBDA and to make a virtual Sparkle endpoint over this data. Mm. Uh, so this is the Sparkle view here. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me just say uh, something. And the Sparkle view, I'm going to give you just a very quick preview here. And mm -hmm. we are going to query this virtual repository. Uh, we use the underlying implementation is the on top project. So this is an open source project. Mm -hmm. But this gives this virtu virtual Sparkle endpoint, which for this query will be translated to a SQL. I was just going to show you how this works. And you mm -hmm. see now you query relational data using a virtual uh, Sparkle endpoint, which mm -hmm. is part of RDB. This gives you federated data using the service call, so you can pull data from multiple multiple relational databases and combine it, combine it in query time in the database. This new feature that you have added, what was the main use case that you were trying to solve with, while, by adding that? The two main type of use cases. One is really decoratively describe and how to produce RDF from a relational model, and the other is on the fly to connect to the remote database. I just want to mention that um, being able to take relational data and then push that into RDF is is so important, and it's it's amazing that you have made this as just a standard part of of your tool because I know not mentioning names, other other databases, um, in order to do that, um, they charge you all of this extra money and it's it's this, mm. this big thing that they have to go in and, and do some messy development work. Whereas what you're doing is making it as a natural progression from relational to graph, which I think is going to really help people with adoption. So this is really exciting. Is th So you said this is part of the new version of GraphDB, is that accurate? Yes, this version was released less than one week ago. And it, they, there are some new exciting features like single sign-on and integration with OpenID, OAuth, and various other types of identity providers. So we create another repository, uh, Star Wars. Uh, this is a public popular That's a great data. example. I love when people use fun examples. <laughs> so I'm going to show you how you can easily update this and make this as easy as possible. Mm -hmm. So in this case, I'm going to put the data in a specific uh, type of a name graph. So I would say it's a uh, hpswopy.com. I'm going to keep this and I'm going to import the data. And uh, basically, the database is going to open a file stream and update the data. It's a not very big data set. Uh, okay, it has 4,000 statements, so everything is immediate. And imagine that now you have a change in the da data set and we have what this in a separate name graph. So the next time you can do is basically just import once again the same file. You say that I want, I want to put it in the same graph, but you are going to check enable replacement of existing data. And this will say that 
it will make an internal delta of the data and it will mm -hmm. just delete the missing statements of in the new file and add the new one. This is especially useful if you have very large graphs which have a few incremental changes and then you don't want to drop all the data and import it once again. You need really a way how just to make this. Uh, sorry, I forgot to lay this. You, you just need a way how to quickly uh, apply the changes. Here we need to confirm that I understand that by replacing graphs you can delete data. So if you misspell a graph or something, you can really delete some data. So use this with console. Yeah, I, I do love this though because one of the hardest things that I I have heard from from the people that I'm working with um, in in the community and myself included, it's so amazing that there are great data sets out there to use. But what happens if you integrate them and then it changes and you have been building things off of that data set? How do you get those changes in effectively? And having something like this, I think would really be useful for that situation because data is constantly changing and you have to be able to keep up with it. GraphDB gives you some visualizations over the data. So the quasi error here is going to, okay, we want a new data set and we don't know much what is inside. So the next visualizations help you really navigate what are the classes of information. And once you select something, you can also see all the different type of instances. So in this case, it's a really small graph with 37 mm -hmm. instances of starships. Class relationship uh, does use uses just a single relation, and this is the RDF type. And then it the, the focus here is how the data is interconnected. And we see that there is one entity film, and that the film is really connected to Type of uh, to type of planet. So, uh, and so are the these all type of relationships? Yes, actually, it's okay. not. It's not only type of. The type of indicates what is the source type and the target mm -hmm. entity class. And you can see how, for example, films and starships are connected. And there is really uh, every starship. Every starship uh, has a film, and then every film has a starship. Basically, it's mm -hmm. a. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a inverse of type of a relation and also mm -hmm. we can find how many uh, so how many just to move this and in order to better see this for example how many species and we have uh, 77 uh, every species 77 different type of species which are connected to the type of film also mm -hmm. the size this type of a strip here indicates how many type of relationships here we have. So it can give you the general distribution of connections and mm -hmm. how they interconnect the different type of entities. Mm -hmm. This is configurable so you can investigate for every type of class individual statistics. The autocomplete index, it, it helps you to find entities by labels. And here I'm typing, for example, look because I know there is a Luke Skywalker is, uh, and the this you index the label of the entity and point me to the URI. So it can also auto suggest the type of entity. So I don't know if you heard me I, when you did that. I, I breathed a sigh of relief. It is so helpful to have this autocomplete feature for subject matter experts that are not used to Sparkle or are not familiar with the shape and the IDs of your data to be able to just do a simple query to find the information they're, lo they're looking for. It sounds like a very simple um, note on the tool, but I will say it does make or break projects sometimes. And we can, in the describe query, we can see all the information about Luke Skywalker, what are the films he participated, and all the metadata, where some enthusiasts basically took out of the movie and recorded it. Uh, mm -hmm. Probably one something more interesting is to go to the visual graph and see how we can navigate the, navigate the graph. And we are really typing the Luke Skywalker. Mm -hmm. Here we see now the name. It's a, in a more clear way. And mm -hmm. what you can see in, for Luke Skywalker is how it's really related to the different type of entities that he's piloting mm -hmm. X-Wing. Uh, mm -hmm. He participates in all these type of movies. Uh, and what is his home planet? And if we click here, we are going to find all different type of uh, that this type of a planet and if you click here uh, you can see all the metadata and you can nice. jump, you can jump in the other menu and also you can jump from the sparkle view to this view in order to easily navigate the data and the next thing the last thing I want to show you 
is a bit some magic how you can also uh, query in a smarter way, not only mm -hmm. with Sparkle queries. So GraphDB has an open source plugin mechanism which allows you to put any type of a machine learning or other type of algorithms close to mm -hmm. the data. So here I'm going to show how we are going to this type of a similarity plugin, which is going to use either the text similarity of the node descriptions or the graph connectivity of the nodes to find similar nodes. So this is mm -hmm. very good for finding duplicate type of entities. And now what I'm going, the, the index is going to be built. Actually, it's a very fast operation because this is a small repository. So the, we use the underlying indexes of uh, random indexing and semantic ve vectors. It's mm -hmm. definitely interesting mm -hmm. to check this algorithm because it's really, uh, it gives a fantastic performance. And I'm, I'm, uh, the abilities here is you can do term to document and the documents in this case are really the graph, uh, the graph nodes. Mm, so okay. the, the type of queries I'm going to ask uh, Princess Leiwa Organa and find somebody else is that this is her identifier and let's see who are on the top place for Leiwa Organa. Uh, okay, uh, it's a Bell Prestor Organa. It's really the senator of Leiwa Organa, which I think is really the some father. Yes, he was the father of Leiwa Organa. So basically, so on this, this, is, this information is really helpful if you want to, when you are running this, does it give you a similarity score for each of these? Because that's very helpful for semantic search if you're doing any kind of mm -hmm. disambiguation or type ahead. Yes, this is exactly all the results are ordered by score here. Oh, so, nice. Okay. Uh, so the scores, and you see that on the second place, we have the URI of Luke Skywalker. Obviously, mm -hmm. they are very similar. Is there any way to configure this if, if people are trying to use this to add similarity scores to um, their graph? Yes, actually, there is a very complex documentation uh, and a tons of options. It's a highly configurable. You can control Great. how the texts are analyzed and tokenized. You can also use the graph, co graph connectivity here mm. uh, and you can combine textual similarity with the graph connectivity matches. So it's a really That's heavyweight awesome. complex algorithm, which also scales and is extremely fast. You can apply it over over large scales of data. It's All right, so thank you, Fazil. This was fantastic. Um, I really am excited. I hope that the audience is also excited because there is a free option with this where they can go in and play around. We have other videos on the channel. I'll link down below um, that are talking about how to just very quickly set up GraphDB. You can also use this demonstration to help you with that, or you can reach out and contact Vasil and the rest of the gang over at Ontotex. 